It's 1.30, we're back. Richard's like raring to go because he's um, an hour early, hour and a half early. Was, and... tried to be. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I've seen like people who are really keen to get on this stream, but <laughs> that took the biscuit to be an hour and a half early. But hey, I love it. I love the Come enthusiasm. time zone. <laughs> yeah, blame the time zone. That's exactly what it is. Um, so obviously... Zone. If you guys don't know who Richard Wright is, Richard Wright is from Software Bisque, and he is going to be talking about the Sky X. Now, before I allow him to speak, I have to do my salesman part, so I have to take off that hat and put on another hat. Right now, we are doing a 10% off on all QHY cameras and um, some of the other things like the guide scope. The Pole Master also is 10% off, but not the adapters that you know now you attach onto it because they're already at a low low price as it is anyway so as you can see on the bottom of this stream somewhere down there there is an actual code uh x3exr i believe um i could just about read it because i'm so far away from my screen and i'm blind half the time if i took my glasses off i could probably read it which is kind of weird so if you guys um, are in the market for buying a camera, a guide camera, a guide scope, or at least a mini guide scope, or you don't even have a pole master yet, get your fingers out your butts and start using that coupon code because I can check to see who's buying what. And if you buy something, I can at least say hello and give you a virtual hug, which you probably don't want right now from me because we'd probably catch something. Okay, so without any further delay, Richard Wright is going to take over the world and show you the Sky X Pro, hopefully. All right. Thank you, Simon. So, yeah, so I'm here to talk about the Sky X Professional. And um, yes, I've been with, uh, I've been with Software Bisque for uh, over 17 years uh, in both uh, part time and full time uh, capacities uh, over that sp span. And I worked um, quite a bit on the Sky. Uh, but the Sky is, it's almost 40 years old. I'll talk a little bit about that at the very end of the presentation. Uh, there's a lot of people who've put a lot of time in the Sky, and I'm, I'm actually very grateful that I have, um, you know, been able to contribute uh, to the Sky myself. I can say, and uh, Steve Bisk said, uh, said something to me, and, I'm, and I like to repeat it, there's not anybody at Software Bisk who actually understands every part of the Sky. It is such a large program and so comprehensive, and it does so many things. Uh, there's not a single person who really understands every nook and cor uh, cranny of it. Um, I would say possibly Daniel would be the closest because he does the documentation. And of course, you know, in order to do, to do the documentation, you have to have a, a good handle on that. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to give you a, a, a thorough overview of a lot of the things that the Sky does. People go, well, what does the Sky do? And I'm going to send them to this YouTube video for now on and say the Sky does all this stuff. So first, um, the first thing I have to say about the Sky X Professional is it is now the Sky Imaging, uh, the Sky Imaging Edition. So we're sort of in the process. Uh, it is official, so I can talk about it, but we're in the process of changing the name of the Sky X Professional uh, to the Sky Imaging. For many, many years, it was just the Sky, the Sky 3, the Sky 4, the Sky so forth. We came up with the moniker of the Sky X when we went cross-platform. And this was uh, shortly after I joined the company. We started doing uh, the Sky for the Mac. And, um, and so it was kind of cool, all right? It's uh, sort of the Sky X because we've crossed, uh, crossed the bridge from, from Windows to Mac. Uh, but we're going to kind of go back to the sky as that's our, that's really our, our history is the sky and the sky imaging. Um, you know, if you have the sky professional and uh, T point and the camera add on that, that's a very powerful package. And that's primarily what I'm going to be talking about. We really don't have very many customers who just bought the sky professional and then they would buy the camera add on and then they'd buy, maybe not buy the camera add on and T point, for example, if you have the Sky Professional, to get the most out of it, you wanted camera control and you really want T-Point. And so we've dropped the price a little bit and we've kind of bundled it all together. And so it's just, it's much less confusing and easier to buy. You just, when you say, get the Sky Imaging, you have T-Point, you have the camera add-on, uh, so you have full control over all your devices. And, um, you know, all, all the Sky charting and planning features are available, but some of the big ticket items, ImageLink, 
uh, all the device control, cross-platform device control, auto guiding, mount modeling and pointing, and scripting. And T Point, um, um, there's been there are a lot of talks just about T Point on the web. If you look about look around for them, and I'm only going to talk about T Point a little bit toward the end, but I do want to say at the very beginning, T Point works on non-paramounts. That's like one of the most important or one of the most common questions I get at star parties and events is like, well, I'd get T-Point, but I don't have a Paramount. It wouldn't do me any good. Oh, T-Point does all kinds of things, whether you have a Paramount or not. So as long as you have a gem, a German equatorial mount uh, that you need to polar align, uh, T-Point uh, has a lot to offer uh, any, of those, uh, any of those mounts. So let's talk about the things that, the sky, that make the sky different or, uh, or very exciting about it. Uh, for starters, the sky is available on more platforms than any other astronomy uh, software uh, available today. So we are on Mac and Windows and Linux and so forth. On Windows, it's a 32-bit app still, uh, but it runs on 64-bit uh, Windows. We actually get a little bit of a memory advantage uh, for reasons I won't go into, but you get almost an extra gigabyte of free RAM uh, just by running on a 64-bit OS. There's some linker tricks you have to do, and I'm not going to tell you what they are, but uh, we, get a, we get a nice little boost uh, from running on 64-bit uh, Windows. The reason uh, we're not 64-bit on Windows right now is because there is a very large, um, there's a very rich set of automation programs that work uh, with the sky or sit on top of the sky, and most all of those and the, the ASCOM stuff is 32-bit and will not work on 64-bit. Uh, however, on the Mac, we're full 64-bit, including uh, all our device support on uh, Linux, uh, primarily Ubuntu. It's 64-bit, x86, full 64-bit OS. Uh, on the Raspberry Pi, we're still 32-bit there. The, um, the Raspbian uh, OS that you get for the Raspberry Pis is still 32-bit. Uh, when that changes, we'll probably release the 64-bit uh, for that as well. And we know that it works on 64-bit ARM because the Sky Fusion, which I'll talk about uh, shortly too, uh, is already 64-bit ARM, uh, ARM platform. So we're ready to go there. We're also on iOS. We have the Sky Mobile for your iPhone and the Sky HD uh, for your iPad. Uh, these do not have all of the features that the desktop version has. Uh, obviously, um, I think it's $30 for the iPad version and a little less for the iPhone version. The, the main reason these exist is uh, for Wi-Fi control of your mount. So let's say you buy a Paramount and you want to have a hand controller, uh, get yourself an iPod Touch uh, or a, um, a low-cost uh, iPad and you can, uh, you can control it uh, that way. They're really great for planning. I really like these. I use the Sky HD myself probably every single day uh, for image planning uh, because it's got some nice, nice features uh, for that sort of thing. Um, we do not have a native Android app. There are only so many people at Software Bisque and so many hours uh, in the day. Uh, but we do have sort of some quasi Android support via the Sky Fusion. Now, the Sky Fusion is a brand new product from Software Bisque, uh, shipping very, very soon. Uh, in fact, I'm, um, I've got a, a, a gun to my head right now to finish up some software th components that we have to do. This is a picture of you know, production model number one on my desk. Uh, so they are, um, you know, very, very pregnant with this project, uh, going to be giving birth very, very soon. But the Sky Fusion is the sky fused with hardware. It's not just uh, the sky installed on a Linux, uh, on a Linux computer. Uh, somebody was asking the other night, I did a whole presentation on the Sky Fusion on the Astro Imaging channel, if I can plug them while I'm at it. And uh, somebody's like, well, can I install a PhD and can I install some other, other things? And the answer is no, because it's not a Linux computer um, that the Sky happens to be installed on. It is a fused experience. The whole operating system has been customized uh, to integrate in with the Sky uh, software. And uh, it is, it's an embedded device. It's like your DVR. You don't boot up to a command prompt on your DVR and start installing uh, little media thing. So that's that's what this is. You, of course, we're available. You can buy the Sky for Linux and put it on your own Linux box if that's what you want to do. Go do that. Uh, no problem. Uh, and we sell the Sky for Raspberry Pi. You can buy some. There are a number of little Raspberry Pi astronomy computers on the market, and the Sky will will run on those. You could uh, make that a, an add-on. So there we go. That's uh, that's you know pretty much across the board uh, operating system support uh, with the Sky, and we're we're very proud of that. 
So what does the sky do? Well, the name of the sky, originally what the sky did was just sky charting. And that's probably, you know, our oldest single feature is creating sky charts that are fully customizable uh, in how you, want, how you want them to look. If you have 3D hardware acceleration, uh, it will make use of your 3D graphics card using uh, OpenGL, the same sort of technology that a, a lot of computer games uh, are, are, are built on. This here is how I, this is actually my screenshot from how I like to customize my chart. I like the, uh, I call them the isophotes. Uh, for the Milky Way there, uh, just sort of, um, and the, the features that I like to see when I'm browsing the sky. But if you want a more photorealistic Milky Way, you can actually drop that in as well. And we also support uh, panoramas. There's a whole bunch of built-in panoramas. This is like the Cayman Islands. It's at night, so it's dark. Well, you, you know, you can do daytime too and throw some clouds in. Um, and you can also load your own panoramas. So if you if you go somewhere and you take your phone and you go in a circle and you make one of those panoramas, you can, you can. Um, there's a place where you can put that in the sky folder and you can have your own panorama. And um, a lot of people do that. They'll go out in the driveway and create a panorama, and so it looks like their yard, uh, and so forth. I'm not big on this feature. A lot of people really like it, uh, but I don't. I like something a little more uh, charty wise. Uh, you know, there are other programs on the market that actually do, uh, you know, a prettier job sometimes. Uh, and if you're looking for something that shimmers and glimmers and goes tinkle, tinkle, uh, so you can turn the lights off and pretend you're in a planetarium, uh, that's fine. But the sky is, um, the sky is a, it's really a productivity app for amateur and professional astronomers. This is a serious tool not an entertainment application. In fact, my second favorite charting, um, uh, you know, option in the sky is this uh, is this map like chart. Uh, imagine a fully interactive digital paper atlas. I, and this is available. This chart actually is available on the iPad. I think this alone is worth thirty bucks on the iPad to have this fully digital, fully customizable paper chart. Uh, and I've I have some friends who are visual observers and not imagers. And they uh, they use their Dobsonians, and they refuse to use a computer to point to anything. And they'll use these paper charts. And the sky can make these and print these. You can export them to PDF, uh, or you can uh, look at them on the screen as you like. And uh, that looks um, that's a really very nice uh, very nice presentation. And you know, just just an aside, I'm a graphics programmer. I'm not an artist. Um, I take pretty good pictures, but I'm not. I'm not really an artist. When I say I'm a graphics programmer, people are like, wow, the sky looks beautiful. You did a really good job on it. And no, no, no. If you ever watched Bob Ross, I'm the guy that makes the paint. Uh, I am not Bob Ross. This is, um, this is uh, you know, the, the family, the Bisque family that's been, that's been doing this and um, at the risk of embarrassing uh, Steve Bisque, uh, most, most of this look uh, is actually Steve Bisque's creation. Uh, not mine, and I've just uh, I've just helped him with the palette and the paints and things like that uh, under the under the covers. Um, it is also, of course, you know, it, animations. Uh, you can speed up time and see the sky, you know, zooming overhead and meteor shower radiance. So we'll we'll actually spit out meteors every now and then. I remember the first time I saw it, I'm like, what was that? I know I saw something on my screen, and the meteor shower radiance are actually quite quite well simulated. Uh, but the sky has a full featured tour facility as well. There's some prepackaged tours to show you how it's done, but you can actually create uh, your own sky shows uh, or like little mini planetarium programs. And uh, and all of the all of the user settings and all of the chart settings that are available in the sky are scriptable uh, using this tool, and you can play them back. So you can speed up time, slow down time, turn on different overlays. Uh, to show things, and then you can save that as a tour, and then play it back. Um, and it's uh, you know it's it's great for you know for educational purposes or for a presentation at your um, at your local astronomy club and that that sort of thing. Uh, now my uh, my big use for the sky, of course, is imaging, which the Sky Imaging Edition is is big for that. Um, it has a lot of features for helping you plan uh, your image runs. Uh, probably the most important base feature that everybody needs to have is a field of view indicator. So I have such and such a camera and I have such and such a telescope. And if we know the size of the sensor and we know the focal length of the telescope, we can compute 
uh, the field of view. So here you can see, let me get my little mouse over here. I've got a little field of view indicator here. Uh, this is uh, you know, one of my refractors and a, and a nice camera. And I know that I can frame up on the Trifid Nebula uh, very nicely. Now this is a screenshot, but you can grab this and rotate it. So it has full support for rotators. And in fact, you can link this to your rotator so you can grab this at night and drag it around and then your rotator will actually spin uh, to, match, you know, to match that orientation for you. It'll also compute your pixel scale if it's a known camera with a known chip. We know the size of the pixels. We can tell you that you know, you're shooting at 0.2 arc seconds per pixel, which might be a little crazy for a deep sky object uh, or if you're shooting at something uh, more reasonable. This is in the uh, iPad HD version. I think this is like why I use it so often. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I have, uh, you know, access to over a dozen telescopes and probably a dozen different cameras. And so I like to just play with this um, and uh, frame up different objects and, and plan what I want to shoot and what I want to use to image it with. Also in the planning, we've got a nice uh, conjunction finder. There's one coming up actually with the moon and Venus. And uh, the sky will find that for you and even does a little cutesy animation, a guy with a little green laser pointer will uh, even point to the location of the sky where you, uh, where you need to be looking for that. Uh, so, you know, if you're, uh, you know, just another thing you can do to sort of, okay, I'm going to be somewhere dark next month. Is there anything interesting going on in the sky? And you can do a quick uh, search for that. Um, eclipses, planning for a solar eclipse. When's the next eclipse? It's going to come across my area. Uh, this came up just the other day. Uh, we were talking about a, a, a trip next year. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if there's any eclipses next year somewhere we could uh, somewhere we could go. And it turns out there's not any great eclipses next year unless we can go to Antarctica. But I know that because I just pulled up the sky. I didn't have to pull up a website. I didn't have to have a special app on my phone that just does eclipses. The sky uh, had that uh, had that already uh, already built in. Uh, so uh, lunar eclipses, of course, solar eclipses aren't the only game in town. And we, uh, we actually have more, we have quite a few uh, lunar eclipses to, to watch as well. And it fully simulates, you know, the, the lunar eclipse. You can even watch the moon enter the umbra and penumbra. So you could actually have a little display live during the eclipse and see where the moon is, when the moon is making contact as you're, you know, regardless of whether you're just looking at it or if you're taking images uh, of the moon. Also, another really, uh, really big feature of the sky is satellites uh, and satellite tracking. Uh, you can download all of the bright satellites. Uh, you know, I've got a special app on my phone that will predict when the ISS is going to fly over. Well, the sky does that too. Uh, it will tell you, and for any satellite as well. Um, and you can download the most, the brighter and popular satellites. You can download the whole list, uh, or if you have. Uh, you know, access, you, you know, you, you satellite nobody knows about, you have the orbital elements, you can put that in yourself and it will, it will do all of the math necessary uh, to compute that. It always amuses me when we're at a show, I don't get this too much at astronomy shows, but every now and then we do one uh, that's more game for, gained, more geared towards the general public. And they're like, how does it know? Does it get that off the internet? And I'm like, no, there's no internet connection. Well, how do you know? I'm like, it's math. It's how we've known before the internet existed. Um, you know, these things can be computed. Um, and, uh, you know, Software Bisque has been doing this for yeah, close to 40 years. And um, there's a lot of people, probably hundreds of man years uh, in this, uh, getting all of this stuff to uh, getting all this stuff to work. But anyway, tracking the ISS, we'll, we'll get to tracking. We'll get back to uh, satellites uh, in a little bit here. Uh, satellites, of course, aren't the only game in town. You can also download and track comets and asteroids, and it'll actually go out over the internet, not calculate their position, but it'll get all the orbital elements for all of the bright satellite uh, comets and the bright uh, asteroids. And once you have a, uh, an up-to-date set of orbital elements, we do all the math uh, to figure it out. If you're going to go somewhere, download the orbital elements before you go, because you may not have uh, internet access. And actually, that reminds me, I'm taking a trip next week. I need to make sure I download um, comet elements before I go. There's a friend who uh, wants to look at comets while I'm there. As far as things to look at in the sky, there's a surprising number of things up there that you can look at. And there is a surprising number of databases uh, that are available of objects and targets that are in the sky. 
Uh, we have someone at Software Bisc uh, who his primary job is to curate these databases. And uh, whenever somebody says, "Hey, Richard, what about blah blah?" blah I'm like, "I don't know. I'll, let me ask. Let me ask Tom. He knows." Uh, but there are a lot of these a lot of these databases, and the Sky Professional ships with the maximum number of databases, or the Sky Imaging, I should say, uh, ships with the full bevy of, of databases. But you can also add your own databases. Uh, we have a database add-on if you want super super deep stuff. Uh, you can like I want the whole Gaia catalog. There's a way to do that. In fact, you can make your own databases. All you need is a comma delimited ASCII text file and uh, a list, which is basically a notepad list of targets. So it can, and it can have a hundred targets in it or a million targets in it. it. It doesn't matter. Or you can make your own uh, Richard's favorite objects. And uh, you, you create this list of the targets with the right ascension and declination and so forth. And you can import that into the sky and it will compile it into one of our indexed optimized database formats and save it in the right location. And now that database is a part of your copy of the sky and you can extend that in any way you want. And we have scientists and astronomers who use, you know, who do that for very specialized cases. We also have really serious astronomers who'll do that with their own, uh, their own observing programs or their own favorite sets, uh, different types of targets or uh, observing goals. Uh, an astronomy club could have its own list of things and you could, you could take that list and compile it in there and then give it to everybody and they would be able to, uh, to do it. Uh, now, a, another great feature, the observing list, is actually a really terrible name. This is really the Sky Database Engine, the observing list. However, the Sky Database Engine is a really boring name and it wouldn't make any sense to people, so I guess we called it the observing list. But you can actually do database queries on all of the databases in the sky. Uh, you can say, I want to search just this database, or I want to search all of the databases. And you can even write queries where you say, like, for example, here, I'm saying, all right, give me all of the globular clusters that are above 45 degrees altitude and are brighter than 10th magnitude. And it'll create a list. Here's, your, here's all the globular clusters that meet your criteria. Uh, and you can do all sorts of really fancy uh, queries, and you can save them as uh, as database uh, as queries. In fact, in the Sky Fusion, there's a there's an alignment wizard, and it runs one of the. I created the query using this tool. I said, all right, I need to know all the stars that are out right now that are brighter than such and such magnitude, and I need all the planets and the moon and the sun because if you run it during the day, I need to be able to do an alignment on a planet. Um, or maybe use the sun or the moon, and the query returns that. And I, I created it with this tool in the sky. There's an expression, eat your own dog food, right? It's like I created this tool for professional or serious astronomers to use. I should be willing to use it myself. I did not create this tool, by the way. I'm being you know metaphorical. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a really very powerful tool for, uh, for your own uh, observing program and for searching, uh, searching your databases. Also in the realm of, you know, nice, you know, you know, upper level features, uh, there is a scripting engine. The sky has two, not one ways to script it. Uh, and we ship the sky with several example uh, scripts and some, some scripts that are actually very uh, genuinely useful, uh, not, just, um, uh, not just examples, but you can actually use them for something. This is one of the scripts I actually did um, a long time ago, learning, learning the scripting language myself. Uh, this is the JavaScript uh, scripting engine, and uh, this is the unguided dithering script. So if you're not guiding and you're just taking lots of exposures, it's nice to bump the mount a little bit between each exposure so that you get the advantages of dithering. So I just wrote a script, and uh, you don't have to be a script writer or a programmer. There's some text up here. It's in English, and all you have to do is put in you know, how many images you want and how long you want the exposures to be, and you click on Run. And it starts taking those images, and between each image, it'll move uh, just a little bit, uh, however big you want your your step size to be. I usually use a very large dither step size when I'm shooting a one shot color camera. This is unguided dither OSC for one got for unshot color. There's also an unguided dither with filters. Uh, so if your filters are parfocal, you can switch between filters. And actually, it'll do red, green, blue, and then it'll do the dither. So it won't even move the mount until you switch. Uh, until you come back around to the same uh, same filter, and these are very easily extendable with just a little bit of uh, 
of tinkering or they're very useful right out of the box with no, uh, no tinkering at all. As I said, there's multiple scripting options. On Windows, we have the VB uh, com interface. This is what almost all of the, um, you know, uh, the Windows-based automation programs use, CCD Autopilot and CCD Navigator and, and all those guys. Uh, they will, um, they use this interface. This is the reason right now, um, you know, we haven't totally rushed to get a 64-bit Windows because all of that stuff would be broken until ASCOM and those guys start making 64. It's kind of a chicken and egg sort of scenario, really. It's who's going to go first and be the only one uh, there. But it is there, and a lot of people like that scripting model. It is very easy to use, um, you know, well-supported by Microsoft. Uh, it does, however, tend to get broken a lot every time Windows updates issues an update. Um, but take that as a Mac and, and Linux guy, um, you know, more than anything else. We do have, of course, a cross-platform JavaScripting interface. We've had this for over 10 years. Uh, it is network accessible, so you don't even have to be on the same machine to automate a remote version of the Sky. Uh, the Sky can operate in server mode. It will listen for connections, and we use a TCP IP interface. These are all standard interfaces, and you just send it little JavaScript snippets, and uh, it does uh, it does what it um, does what it wants to do. Uh, so that's this is also we we on our forum. There's a uh, there's some people who 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 this is what they do. They write these scripts and we've got scripts that'll do all night imaging and it'll even do guiding and find guide stars for you. And all that's available on the uh, software BISC um, community website on our, on our forum. And they're all built. Uh, most of them are built on this JavaScript interface. Uh, the people who are most enthusiastic about this tend to be uh, the Linux guys uh, running on the raspberry Pis, or they're on a Macintosh. And so they're trying to do their own, you know, automate, you know, not as too sophisticated automation, but they want to automate a single night. You know, I want to be able to run tonight, do a couple of targets. And we actually have another way to do that in the sky that I'll uh, talk about in a little bit. Um, it tracks. So, uh, you know, most mounts support RA and DEC uh, tracking rates. Actually, most mounts uh, really only support RA, uh, a variable RA uh, you know, tracking rate. So they can set the RA to the right ascension to either, you know, solar rate, side reel rate, or sometimes lunar rate. But if you can track uh, RA and deck, if your mount will do that, uh, the Sky X will control the mount and it will track, uh, track that object. So when you do a tracking on the lunar rate, it's not just the lunar RA rate, you also get some declination movement as well. And that's nice at really high power uh, viewing of the moon when you're on a particular crater, you don't want that crater to uh, drift out. I do this with lucky imaging. Um, you know, I'll get on a crater and start my video camera going, and and I don't want my field to drift too much outside that uh, outside that range. If you've never done uh, lunar imaging, uh, the moon moves against the background of the stars, and it's quite significant. And if you don't set the mount to track the moon, and it's just tracking at the at the uh, side reel rate, uh, the moon drifts quite rapidly uh, out of the field of view, especially at very high magnifications. Uh, when you're when you're either looking at it or or doing video, uh, this is also really great for comets. Uh, so you can set the uh, tracking for a comet rate, and it'll it'll track that comet. And so you can do long exposures on the comet head without having to guide on the comet head necessarily. The stars are going to be streaked, uh, but the comet and the tail and everything will be you know well uh, well positioned through most of your exposures. Uh, finally, there's satellites. Uh, and this does, you know, a little proviso, um, you know, tracking a satellite is hard. Uh, you have to have really good pointing and for one thing to, to get on the satellite. So when you slew to a satellite, you usually don't have a lot of time to, f to fish around for it. Uh, you want the satellite to be in your field of view as soon as you slew there and even at long focal lengths. And you have to be able to move the RA and the deck axis on the mount very quickly. And there aren't a lot of mounts that can do that. I do know one in particular, <clears throat> the Paramount, uh, that does an excellent job uh, tracking uh, satellites. In fact, uh, we, you know, we we very successful in the, um, you know, our, our uh, industrial solutions, uh, and then the the SSA market, the space situational awareness awareness. But you can also do this from your backyard. In fact, I have a video. I'm going to quit this, and uh, Simon wanted to see this particularly. Hopefully, this will work. This is my friend Kevin Lagore. I hope he's listening. This is with his um, 
one hundred uh, is a spree one fifty. Hey, stop that. That's not nearly enough. Um, this is with his Esprit 150 tracking the International Space Station. I think it was it may have been a Paramount MX Plus or it may have been a, a Mighty. It's one of the two Paramounts. Uh, but he slewed. Um, I guess it's not as long a video as I thought it was. No, it's only it, it's but... only seven seconds. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to freeze it there. That is the International Space Station, and um, you know he was you know he, he he was doing a video of that. And that's uh, that's pretty awesome. Let me go back to the slides and show you this. No, what happened there? There we go. So on this red screen here, I took this with my iPhone. This was on the this was on a hotel parking garage at the top. We were at a satellite tracking conference in uh, Maui, and we were doing demos. This is an eighty millimeter refractor, by the way, on a Paramount Mighty, and we flew all this to Hawaii. And that little dot there is actually the satellite and the streaks are the stars. And this is a long exposure on a satellite and it tracked that satellite and it kept, it kept it on that central set of pixels going across the sky, uh, you know, to get that image for the satellite to show up. And you can see the stars, you know, the stars are of course moving because the satellite's moving against it. And I think that's one of the best, you know, examples of, you know, what the sky can do with a Paramount mount uh, you know, getting on that target and keeping it, uh, keeping it centered long enough for a long exposure uh, at a very high, you know, at a very high tracking rate. So that's, um, that's pretty, pretty awesome. So what else does the sky do? Well, it does imaging. Let's get to my next uh, slide here. You know, all the things that, you know, you need to do uh, when you're, when you're imaging, okay, camera control, we have color preview, for uh, one-shot color cameras, uh, a lot of these features are fairly new. People uh, who haven't looked at the sky in a while coming back go, wow, there's a lot of, there's a lot of new stuff in here. Um, so I'm going to talk about most of these in more detail, so I'm not just going to read the slide to you. Uh, one of the things I'm very excited about is our new screen stretch. We have a new proprietary screen stretch. Um, you know, some of our older screen stretch, they were really designed to help you find, you know, detect things. And so uh, it kind of depends on what your goal is as an amateur astronomer. We have a lot of customers now who are looking to take pretty pictures and they're not trying to detect very faint things and see the faintest ghost of something showing up. And they, even if they're taking a quick ex picture, they want something with a nice smooth background. So we have a nice uh, new, um, a new uh, screen stretch method called the heuristic uh, method. And you can set that as your default uh, auto contrast, it's not turned on by default, uh, but you can easily uh, go in to your camera settings and just set that to be the default and uh, you get the new, uh, the new auto stretch. The new auto stretch also supports uh, color camera uh, preview and this will work with your DSLRs or with most one shot color <coughs> cameras <clears throat> when you use our, um, when you use our plugins uh, for the cameras, it embeds the, you know, biz, embeds the Bayer pattern uh, in the fits file. And then if you load that into our fits viewer, uh, it'll, it'll colorize it for you. Uh, and so that you can preview it right there on the spot. What else does the sky need to do? It does do guiding. Um, I don't guide, uh, people who know me, they, it's one of those things. It's like Richard, he's the Starbucks guy that doesn't guide, right? That's what everybody, uh, says about him. Uh, so this photo is actually from, this screen capture is actually from 2013. I have guided since then, but this was the only one I, I'd found that I'd, I'd done somewhat recently. Uh, but the sky does, does guiding, uh, you know, out of the box, the sky imaging, it already has guiding built in and it's already integrated with the sky's image capture. So you can do dithering with guide, with the guide camera if you want. You can also use the guiding feature to train your periodic error. Uh, on your on your paramount as well, and this is just you know we got a little three D graph here uh, showing um, you know how bright your star is, and this is a pretty typical guider guider graph. You can see the deck; it's all pushing in one direction, and the RA we got a little bit of periodic error, and so the scatter chart kind of is clumped like that. And this is a really nice you know how long was this exposure? Ah, this is a 20 minute exposure. So yeah, 20 minutes, you're, you're gonna need to, most of the time you're gonna wanna guide for a 20 minute exposure. But it does um, it does guide and you can do all of the, 
you know, all the fancy stuff. Uh, like I said, I don't guide very much, uh, but you can do all the fancy stuff like only guide an RA and leave deck alone or change the aggressiveness, uh, have it be different for the RA and for the deck axis uh, and things like that. So, oh, another fairly new addition to the sky that I'm very excited about. <clears throat> this is a feature that I worked on uh, uh, quite a bit myself as well is live stacking. Now I will, uh, Simon asked if I was going to start any fights and I realized I said, no, no, I'm not going to pick any fights. I am now I'm going to pick a fight. Um, I always giggle when I see advertisements about, you know, get our live stacking camera and cause it's, you don't need a special camera to live stack. There's, there's no such thing as a live stacking camera. Uh, the sky can live stack with any camera. Um, and, and I think SharpCap, you know, also has that feature. It'll live stack with, with, with any camera as well to, you know, to be, you know, fully dis full disclosure here, but uh, any camera that works in the sky can live stack. Uh, and it works with color or, uh, or, um, or monochrome cameras as well. And you can set up the exposures uh, for, for your live stack. And what, what is live stacking, by the way? Because when I'm doing outreach, I always tell the people in my club, don't say live stack. Nobody knows, all right? You're talking nerd talk, all right? The guy coming to, par to, to Starbucks and you, you, you uh, ambushed him in the parking lot. He doesn't know what live stack is. Say, come and look at this image. What live stacking does is it takes each image and it aligns the image based on the star. So if, number one, it detects, it detects the stars and it kind of uses them as anchor points. And then it will translate and rotate the image as it needs to, to align it with the previous image and then combines them. So when we do deep sky, pretty picture stuff, we take lots of images and we stack them uh, to get the, a good signal to noise ratio. Well, this is doing the same thing, is it's just taking very, a lot of very short images uh, they could be a couple of seconds or several minutes long if you want, and it will align and combine them on the fly. So you can literally watch the image develop in front of you uh, while you're doing it. And this is a fun way to do outreach. It's also fun even when you're doing deep sky stuff, like I'm doing five minute exposures. Sometimes I'll just live stack for a little bit to watch the image develop um, uh, in, in front of me. And it's, it's pretty fun. Uh, the live stack feature uh, you can also ex export straight from the live stack to JPEG or TIFF or PNG or something like that, even if you want 16-bit full TIFF, uh, or you can even export it as a FITS file. You can also save all the individual FITS files. So you could live stack and then go back and then do a more, uh, you know, I'm going to get picks and sight out and I'm going to do a, you know, a really more rigorous calibration and all those sorts of things. You can still do that because the data is still there for you. But also while you're in the, you know, you're somewhere and you just want to save a quick JPEG and post it on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or something, uh, you can do that right away. Now, my experience with live stacking was that uh, live stack images didn't look that great unless you calibrated them a little bit. And so we put in uh, some calibration wizards for live stacking and it will automatically build your dark and it'll automatically build you a, uh, a flat field. Now the flat field is a little tricky to build. You got to do it right at twilight, or if you have a flat panel or something, you can do that. But the flat field wizard will take a couple of exposures and assuming your camera is at least somewhat close to linear, which uh, even some really, you know, most, most cameras are, you know, at least somewhat linear, uh, it, will, uh, it will adjust the exposure uh, to get a, a good full well so that the, the flats are going to work. Uh, pretty well and then it'll build a flat for you it'll just take a bunch of pictures and uh, it also takes some darks for the flats and it properly calibrates them and it'll apply it uh, to your images and this is really important especially for color images if you calibrate for live stack for color it, it really helps a lot because the biggest problem is you've got a lot of vignetting and then the auto histogram stuff it doesn't it, it the edges are all dark and it, it trying to get that histogram to look right uh, from a computer science standpoint is very difficult. But if a properly calibrated image, you can do all sorts of things. Here's some examples of live stack. These were all taken on the same night from the parking lot at Starbucks in Lake Mary, Florida, outside of uh, Orlando. And uh, on the same night, which means what about this moon? Yes, the moon was out too. So not only was I in a bright parking lot, but the moon was out. Most of us were looking at the moon uh, at this particular event. Now the horse head, is a bend hydrogen alpha image, but they're, those are 30 second images stacking up and 
you can see the horse head nebula. The, the Orion Nebula here is 15 seconds, uh, so a little bit shorter. But this is, this is Andromeda. These are 25 seconds, and they're luminance. They're luminance with no light pollution filter. And I'm not taking anything away from light pollution filters, but if um, it's surprising what you can get, even with the luminance on a monochrome camera when you live stack the results. Um, and it, it, I mean, there's a lot of detail in here. I got a little bit of a dust bunny there. It didn't calibrate. Uh, my flats weren't exactly perfect, which often happens. Uh, but it did a really good. It did a really good job. And this is auto stretch too. I didn't tweak this or Photoshop it or um, pix and cite it to death. This is right out of the auto stack. This is a live screen capture. I was actually looking at it remotely with my iPad, and I just did a capture on the iPad uh, to get that. There's some cutesy things that are nice for public groups. You can put a little rubber. Uh, gasket over there. Uh, so it looks, looks like that's my electronic eyepiece. You can also go full screen and completely get rid of um, get rid of the GUI so that you don't see the GUI at all. You can also get rid of the eyepiece thing. So there's a lot of options where you can have a nice full screen display of the image developing uh, in front of you. Uh, focus wise, uh, you can't do imaging without being able to get good focus. So we have autofocus. And uh, I'm most excited about At Focus 2. We still, I mean, At Focus 3. We still have At Focus 2, uh, but At Focus 3 is our is our newest one. The thing that's really great about At Focus 3 is it focuses on anything. I was talking about uh, shooting uh, the moon. I like to do uh, lunar photography, and I would have to focus on a star uh, with At Focus 2, and then I would have to slew back to the moon, or you know, try to focus uh, manually. Uh, but F Focus 3 is very smart and it will focus on anything. Uh, it keeps going if it's approaching. Uh, so it's it's got a little bit of AI built into it. It knows that I'm going further and further out of focus, so it'll switch direction. It also can tell when you're getting saturated. So if the exposures are too long, it'll automatically decrease the exposure time. And it also does uh, backlash compensation. So if you don't have a focuser that has backlash compensation built into it, you can put that into Add Focus 3 and it'll automatically uh, back up and, and move forward for you. You can also uh, auto select subframes uh, to speed it up. And in good seeing, you can also get good performance. So here's a quick, there's the moon. So you can focus on the moon, which is also really great. So a couple other little things, I'm almost out of time, Simon is telling me. Uh, LTI, just real quick, we have a new front end for the sky called LTI or light. It stands for, it's short for light for imaging. And LTI is designed for when you're using remote uh, access to your laptop or your little digital computer. And it's designed to present on a, um, on a tablet. So it actually walks you through the whole workflow all with a tablet interface. And the take series in LTI will also uh, switch targets and do focus runs for you. LTI does not guide. Uh, it's designed to be, you know, kind of a quick and easy way to image. If you want all the bells and whistles, then, you know, the full, the full package is, is there for you. Uh, another new feature is the collimation tool that runs full screen, and you can put little circle overlays on there. I always have a hard time when I look at this donut. Is it round or is it sort of round? Um, and it's got some nice little shortcuts in there. You can, you can start focused and then back way out, make your collimation adjustments, recenter, and then with the button, it'll just go back to where you were and refocus for you. And so you know, if you've done collimation or struggled with it, this is, it's an iterative process. And it's just a tool that makes that a little bit easier uh, for you. ImageLink uh, does plate solving, which is basically it uses, a, it, it detects all the stars in the image and does a pattern match against uh, stellar databases. So it can tell you exactly where you're pointing. So uh, not just the telescope thinks it's pointing here, you take a photo and you know exactly where, uh, where you're pointing. And there's a lot of features that are built around uh, ImageLink. One of, the, one of the cool things you can do is you can load an image from the other night, select that image, and tell it to slew to that image. And you, we can do something called a closed loop slew. It'll actually slew to the image, take some photographs, do the uh, pattern match for you, and then adjust the telescope to make sure you're right where you were the next night. And so if you've got an imaging run or a project that takes multiple nights, you can make sure you're in the same spot on the same target. You ever, if you've ever done a stack where you know half the images are too far to the left and some are too far to the right, 
this will help you with that and keep everybody uh, nice and handy. So second to last slide, Simon. Uh, T-Point, a few things about T-Point. Uh, T-Point is uh, started um, in the 70s. Uh, a man named Patrick Wallace started doing telescope man, uh, modeling and he developed a modeling package for professional observatories. And Software Bisque, uh, first we licensed that for a while and later on we actually acquired uh, the company and the technology. So T-Point is fully uh, owned by Software Bisque. And uh, you don't have to have a paramount to do mount modeling. It, the mount modeling will work on any uh, German equatorial mount. In addition to improving your pointing performance, it also will give you polar line. It takes into account uh, polar alignment errors, you know, all the crooked things that are on your mount. It's amazing how the front of your telescope is two millimeters higher than the back of the, your telescope, what that'll do uh, to your pointing. But it'll also provide pointing and uh, polar alignment analysis for you. And if you have a, a pro, if you have a paramount, it will actually take all of that into account to modify the tracking rates, uh, so that even if you're off the pole, you're not going to get uh, you're not going to get things that are drifting out uh, too much. One of the a cool tool that works on any para, any non paramount any any mount is if you do a T point model, it'll slew to a star and center it. And then it'll slew off the star by your polar alignment error. And then you move the mount, uh, the mount's knobs, not the hand controller, but you physically move the mount to recenter the star. And then it, it factors that into the model for you. And uh, you don't have to run another T-point model. You have a really, you have, you have the best, you know, compromised polar alignment and it's already, and then you're ready to go. All right, last slide. And then maybe we'll have some questions. Um, just want to kind of reiterate the sky has come a long way from 1983 when Steve Bisk uh, uh, started this. Uh, it has evolved a lot. Uh, and I, I, I came up with, I actually came up with this slide last night and it's like, this is really, I'm really proud to, to be a part of this, um, you know, from where it's come uh, to where it is now. The full evolution on the desktop across operating systems. Uh, we're on devices now. And in fact, we've got our own device now with the Sky Fusion, where the hardware and the software are, are really uh, tightly integrated and, and working together uh, to create that. And I'm just very grateful for the role that I've got to play uh, and will continue to play, uh, you know, uh, in this with this software. So, all right, that's the that's the whirlwind tour because it is a deep product and it does a lot of stuff. But I think I get, I I hope I gave you a good uh, overview of the you know all the hot topics. Yeah, I, you know, I got to ask you this: Do you guys think you would do like um, a two or three day? session to go through how to use the functions because a lot of these presentations that i've seen in the past we've all seen what it can do but not all of us know how to do it and i think right. that's a, the biggest fear because one person mentioned is there a free version or a trial version available not at this time not at this time. It comes up in topic. It comes up in conversation. So well, it always comes up like, to me. It, it's 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 not like oh, we never thought of that. Uh, so not not at this time. I remember engineer, not spokesman. That's true, <laughs> but not not at this time. And we have done uh, we used, we've done a couple of Paramount workshops where we would do a a two day um, yes thing, and we'd do software one day and hardware, and we had two tracks and they flipped, and that worked really well. The problem is it. It's it's expensive, uh, not not just money wise, but uh, you know I'm in Florida and we got people in Colorado and uh, people in California and so we all have to fly somewhere to be together, and it's a uh, you know and we're behind we're always behind we have way more ideas than we have time, so the the perpetual state of the perpetual internal state at Software Bisque is always we are behind because we have more things to work on than we have time to, to work on. So it's difficult to get everybody's schedule synced uh, because we all have different commitments, you know, internal and external. So that's, it's hard to do. Uh, we have done it a few times and we do participate. Uh, you know, I go to star parties and usually we'll do uh, things at star parties uh, because I have to go to the star party anyway. So I might as well do that. So, um, Really, the only way to do that is is to catch us at a star party or at a, an event like NEF or something where we'll 
uh, we can do those types of workshops. We were talking about, actually, there's a star party this year. I wanted to do kind of the, the paramount thing with that star party, just because I like the star party and I needed an excuse to go and get, get them to pay for it. <laughs> uh, however, if you haven't noticed, a lot of star parties this year have been canceled. So well, that's we'll circle why back we've around. Been doing this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that's why, you know, we're in my office at home and Simon's in, you know, his, his office at home and uh, we'll circle back around to that uh, for sure. I will circle back around to that. And there are, there are lots of YouTube videos already in, in existence. And um, I've been on the Astro Imaging channel a few times showing how things are done there. And there's lots of Woodland Hills videos. And uh, we'll probably do some more. Uh, but yeah, it, we know yeah. we need to do it. But yeah. I, I think we definitely need to do, um, of course, depending on uh, the popularity of it. And I can tell just by looking at the chat, it's, it's quite active as usual. Um, I but know. I think Hi. I think we definitely have to do a session. We're going to have to probably do a long slog all day thing. So we might have to get multiple people to do the talk. Can't have you talking all day. Otherwise, you know, you'll be a zombie right. by the end of this. Yes. <laughs> but I definitely <laughs> think um, I should do a dedicated day. Um, Bob's actually waiting in the wings. I'm going to see if I can pull him in right now. Hi, Bob. Just Hold on, he's not he's not in here yet. We'll see oh, him he's not if he yet. joins in. Okay. Let's, let's, he's not got his video turned on. But let's see if Bob's we can drag nice him in. Guy. Bob's a nice guy. So you know, I'll I'll tell you this is what you get for tuning in. So you tune in, you gotta get you gotta get something that you wouldn't get otherwise. I'll say something I'm not supposed to say. Um so I'm gonna tell you something I'm not supposed to tell you. Um, oh. most of the most of the vendors uh and the competitors, we actually like each other a lot more than our customers think they do, think we do. And when we get together at Neef and things, it's not for customers. It's so that we can see each other, right? It's you know, like, the, funny, you know, the funniest it, thing it, is, it is. That's yeah. when the when, when we're actually at the bar and things like that, and the customers are looking in on us, they don't realize we're that all we're happy. All friends. We're all friends. We go to dinner with each other every night. It's like, oh, who do I want to go to dinner with? And exactly. It's like, You're going to dinner. You know, our customers are are like are like calling each other names on on cloudy nights and whatnot. And meanwhile, we're at dinner laughing over dessert, you know, or over a beer or something. And because and you know and you know, there's a limit to what we can talk about. But I mean, let's face it, we're geeks. We're nerds. Nobody at home understands this, right? So when we get together, we get together with our competitors. It's like, well. That's cool, but at least you understand what I'm talking about, right? Right. But you know, I the mean, funniest thing is some of the best ideas also come from these little fun get togethers. Indeed. Indeed. The Sky HD supports uh, Bob Denny's program. You know why? Because Bob Denny and I were talking at AIC and said, hey, let's do this. That's and, exactly right. That was a great yeah. conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's it's like being on in, in collegiate sports. It's like they're on the other team. And you're trying to beat them, but at the same time, you both love football or you both love what it is you do. Only what we do isn't nearly as popular as football, and so our spouses and our family would think we're weird. So when we can get together with other people who are just like us, it's great, and uh, totally. we really look forward to that. And so this year, you know, I, actually we we've done a couple of. Um, zoom meetings where we all just get together and there there's 30 of us and we're talking about stuff because we couldn't get together for neef uh and, you know or or whatever so anyway so there you know, there's your there's your dirty insider secret there's but there you go for, for you know what to, the funniest thing is talk. i think people um when they first hear me but they have no idea what i look like is the big ah. shock and the funny ah. thing here is when people first met me at AIC, they weren't expecting me. They just hear this guy with a British accent who talks too much. And then suddenly I show up and they're like going, uh, yeah, ZWO's over there. I'm like going, I don't work for ZWO. <laughs> and they're like, hold on a minute. Wait, you, you don't look British. Wait a minute. You exactly. Like John Cleese. <laughs> exactly. I, I catch everybody Nothing out. Like the Monty Python people. Now, it's Michael Hattie, Michael Hattie from Starlight Express, that man looks British. He exudes Britishness. He and does. I say that I say that as a compliment. That man, you can see him in the parking lot, and you know, that man is British because he is just proper British in every 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 means of a every every means. Anyway, I've talked long enough. We're gonna let Bob talk next. So that's, yeah. 
yeah. So um, <laughs> we are actually going to take a quick five minute break because I did build in breaks so I could go to the bathroom. There was a time where I didn't build in breaks like an idiot. And I sat here for almost four hours straight, <laughs> which was absolute torture. Um, so I'm going to give everybody a chance to go to the bathroom. And then once we are ready, my side of things, we will keep, keep this show up and running. Um, Unfortunately, we don't really have time for a Q&A with uh, Richard, and I know you guys are going to bombard him with questions, but if you need to get a hold of him, I'm sure there are plenty of ways that you can poke him here and there. For those of you who already know who he is, if not, find him on Instagram. He is pretty active on there. In fact, I haven't seen you on Instagram post for a while. Uh, I just posted something yesterday. Did I you? Think. Oh, I must have yes, missed it. Yes, I have to the go fusion. The fusion That's in my right, backyard. You did. Yes, did. you did. I did. But I've got I've got a couple of pictures in the queue I need to post. I'll post one as soon as I get off of here. So yeah. it's Accidental Astro on um, Accidental Astro on uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram both. So there you go. So try not to um, bombard him too much. So we'll be right back in about five minutes. So we okay. I can go to the bathroom and Hopefully we'll catch you shortly. So don't go away. Five minutes, give or take, and we'll go from there. 